We need to be clear about priorities. And I know when we talk about priorities on health, it gets difficult. But we do need to talk about priorities, and we need to talk about who does what. Because in these challenging financial times, it's even more crucial than ever that duplication of effort and overlap are removed. But if we're going to do that, we also have to be sure and we have to be very alert to the downside of that, which is the danger of allowing gaps in our coverage to develop that would leave workers needlessly at risk anonymous taking care of that issue on their behalf. So we believe our strategy is well aligned with the programmes that are being outlined by the new government, but it's more important than ever, given what we know about their priorities, that we ensure, all of us, that public funding bodies continue to strive to be effective and to be efficient. And that has to mean for us, and I would suggest for many of you, sticking to those areas which are our strength, where we have expertise, and being clear about what we lead on and where we do not lead. Now, for many years we've been able to report an encouraging story on continual improvement in workplace safety. The numbers of fatalities and serious injuries which occur in Great Britain's workplaces continue to show a steady year-on-year -year improvement. The last official figure for 2008-9 was 180 workplace fatalities. And the unofficial statistics for 2009-10 indicate that there's been even further improvement in the last year in those statistics. You know, as we do, that the picture on occupational health is not so encouraging. We know also that in part this is exacerbated by the difficulties in reporting, which leads to less robust data sets. We move away from statistical validation and into those areas of estimation. There are difficulties that come when trying to capture information related to such a broad range as well of health-related issues. Sometimes what's being observed is clearly work-related, not in anything else. But on other occasions, that link isn't so immediately apparent. Many of the conditions that we know can be caused by work also have other, often more common causes. Lung cancer is an example. Smoking would be most people's instant reaction as the primary cause. But that's also the case in things like leisure activities and back pain. So we can't simply count the cases, report the numbers. We have to find other ways of assessing those which are important, whether or not we are managing them successfully, and whether or not we can do anything that will make a difference to those numbers and over what time period. But, taking all of those things into account, in 2008-9, what were, and all those caveats taken care of, we still estimate that 1.2 million people reported suffering from an illness which they believe was caused, or at the very least made worse, by their current or their past work. And over half a million of those were new cases. In excess of 2,000 people died from mesothelioma. And we have good evidence that thousands more die each year from other occupational diseases and cancers. Because with the exception of mesothelioma, we cannot simply count individual work-related deaths from these causes. And as I said, the numbers have to be estimated. They can't simply be counted. And I know that you've heard earlier today from Dr. Leslie Rushton, the latest estimates which suggest that the annual number of deaths from work-related cancer is around 8,000. 
And you will be aware, and well, as well, I'm sure, that recently the WHO's International Agency for Research on Cancer has classified shift work involving disruption of the body clock as probably carcinogenic and increasing in particular the risk of breast cancer in women doing such work. The implications of this finding are clear. And again, citing Dr. Rushton's work, she suggests that this could add about 2,000 potentially avoidable breast cancer cases each year if further research confirms a cause and effect association. I choose this example simply to demonstrate the point that we are still learning. This is not an area which is at the same level of maturity as our knowledge about safety. We are still learning about the possible workplace exposures which cause ill health that we need to address. And we are also at the same time continuing to tackle those which we already know about, such as asbestos, some of the chemicals we already know cause harm, dusts like silica and so on, but where there is still more work that we need to do. So this is difficult territory. It's generally accepted that the current pattern of work-related deaths largely reflect industrial conditions of the past. So how do we relate that to where we are today? The death toll that the legacy of the past has left us with is great, and we still have to deal with that. But our challenge, and where we can actually make a difference, is in ensuring that that doesn't continue into the future. And in that respect, we can take encouragement that the evidence again tells us that the exposure to major hazards has indeed been declining. For asbestos, the evidence is that rates of mesothelioma at age under 55 are now falling. This we can take, we believe, as evidence of the positive effect from the earlier action was taken to reduce and control exposures.